Bismillahir Rahman Nir Rahim. Reasons for Decline of Muslims. By Alama Ghulam Ahmed Parwe. Part 4. Kufa after Iman. To become a non-Muslim after converting to Islam. Colon. When the Quranic deen changed and degraded into religion and monarchy. Then the living and breathing examples of its practical order of life, its natural results began to become extinct and non-existent. Their extinction, Quran had shown in clear and lucid words, were results directly dependent on laws and not with a people or their style or elegance. Hence, when these people who had faith and belief in the originality of this code of life denied it in practice, then its paths of achievement and success were shut or closed on them. Consider how and with what eloquence the Quran has said. Well, how can the laws of God open up on these people the paths of success, elevation and evolution who after Iman on his laws and their splendid results, hereafter deny them? In practice. Whereas in actual fact they have seen with their own eyes that by acting in practice on these laws and code of life how the Rasul. Peace be upon him. With his endeavors and efforts had created such constructive results. And in this way, before them glowed clearly all the reasons and proofs of this code of life. 3. 86-87. Allah's laws never open up its paths on those people, the paths of elevation and evolution, who do not let the truths or facts remain in their place, as they should be. This is called zalm, as a natural result of their behavior. It so happens that these people are deprived of all those beautiful consequences which the law of God turns into concrete proofs and results by the universal laws working in conjunction with the organizational order of humankind. Don't just glance over the aforesaid ayat. It explains a very great principle. It explains the consequences of kufr after iman. Iman has declared human life to be an indivisible entity, a unity. Its denial has created a division in this order of unity and split into two different groups, I. E. This world and the hereafter. In this way, religion and monarchy came into being, with the result that these people were deprived of all the concrete results of the Code of Deen. Authority and religion are after all deans two different pieces but it is a strange occurrence that after separation nothing remains of deen in any one of them. Again, consider the example of water, which has the natural and distinctive quality in that it puts out the fire. But if its two constituents, hydrogen and oxygen, are separated let alone putting out fire, hydrogen itself is combustible, while oxygen helps to act as an aid for burning all the more. Nothing could burn without oxygen. That is to say that in the constituents of water any one single constituent no longer has the property of water remaining in it. Instead, opposite characteristics or conditions emerge. Likewise, with the division into two separate portions not only nothing remains of Deen but religion and authority, the two become opposites of Deen. Deen came to create unity while religion and authority dismembered the nation and brethren in faith. And this was the natural result of running or shirking away from the divine laws. This is called azab. Punishment. 6. 65. Tell them that God's law has the overall power to bring upon you a zab. Punishment. From the external world or from the inner world. From under your feet if you oppose or go against the law of God. Or you are divided into groups jumbled up in confusion. And in this way your unity ends. And. Become victims of each other's forceful strength. See. How we bring the truths and facts before you repeatedly. So that you may think and contemplate. The clerical class has created such a distance between the results and the acts and deeds, that they have postponed everything on the hereafter, thereby left with no share whatsoever of this world. The members of the government directed all its attention on the immediate gains. The world. 
Hence their present became good and fruitful but their future could not become bright. Which is why after some time they lost even the government and state. Now, consider how the Quran has shown and with what clarity the difference between the seekers of the present and the seekers of the future and the consequences. 9.38. Oh, those claimants of Iman! What has happened to you? When it is said that you raise your step on the way of Allah, then they become heavy and hold on to the earth. Have you become unwary of the future and have fallen for the immediate gains? If this is the case then, you have made a blind spot of the fact that the nearby gains have no status or rank against the future. If you insist on remaining this way then what will be its consequences? 9.39. If you do not take a step for a bright future then remember God will greatly and severely punish you for it that is, in your place bring another people. You with this deviation could not harm God's law in any way but you yourself would be ruined. Remember that Allah has for everything, fixed measures on which he has absolute control. Consequently, in this way their large and expansive countries gradually came to an end and were rolled and wrapped up into small kingdoms and feudal systems with their existence on the mercy and bounty of the Western world. As long as these states meet with the political expediency of the Westerners they will exist. When they no longer are needed, an end will be put to them. The unity of the Milith has since long vanished and there is no existence in any form or any semblance of unity in these states. Not even the sort of unity as is found in a non-Muslim country. Hence the position is that one state is pitted against the other, in the manner that one particular sect is fighting the other religious sect. The result of this schism and disunity had such a drastic and tell-tale effect that their society, their scholarly resources and their way and view of life, one and all became foreboder of dejection, melancholy and heralders of death. Culture, mysticism, jurisprudence and scholasticism, all are alien idols. And this was so because in legends and myths was truth amiss. The Ummah was lost but in traditions and legends. Contemplation and deliberation. Quran has at every step invited the Muslims to think and contemplate. They were asked to ponder and think on the earth and the skies, human self, and on horizons of this present and the future. 2. 219 to 220. In this way Allah shows his signs openly and clearly so that you think and contemplate on present and the future. He has in very clear terms shown that if you wish to safeguard yourself from suffering then the method to do so was to observe and contemplate on the earth and the skies. From this you will study the laws of God which are in action in the entire universe. And when you come to learn which law is actually and actively in force in this amazing and fantastic series and in what balance, proportion and symmetry moving through its evolutionary stages, onwards, then only you will understand how inevitable it is for you to make this all-embracing law prove effective for your collective life. This is what it connotes to mean Zikr of Allah. 3. 190 to 191. This is a fact that in the creation of this universe and the earth and in the notations of the night and day there are for the gentlemen of understanding, knowledge and discernment. The proven signs of the divine law and its unshakable firmness and strength. Signs for them. Such is the state of these gentlemen of learning that standing. Sitting or lying they place before themselves the laws of God, and think and contemplate on the creation of the earth and the heavens and by this manner of deep and careful thought and contemplation, see for themselves right before them, clearly and manifestly that Allah's law of growth and development was not created so that its destructive side overpower or overcome the constructive sides and in this way make this world a veritable hell.
God's program of constructive development is far removed from these disastrous consequences. He has also made this fact clear that those people who work their way through contemplation may be few in numbers, but they are always in power and strength over the majority who takes no heed to the importance of thought and contemplation. 8. 65. If from among you only hundred persons become such, who act only through thought, wisdom and common sense, they will surely overpower a thousand kafirs because the group of kafirs are such who do not use their wisdom and thought. This then is the secret of the success of the people. As long as this Quranic knowledge remained in focus before the Muslims, they continued to observe and contemplate on nature and its elements and to control and harness the forces of the universe, accepting this to be the duty of life. But when religion's blind ancestral worship made their faculties of thought and reason paralytic then to use the faculties of thought and reason became haram on them. Who is an alam? Quran had used the word alam in the sense of the modern usage of the word scientist. See how this fact becomes evident in Surah Fata. 35. 27-28. Do you not observe that it is the law of Allah that brings down the water from the clouds, and this water, and its mixture with this soil, creates various kinds of fruits, and the red, white and various layers of colors in the mountains, and some, akin to the stone of Moses, having blackness in them. From the world of vegetables, minerals and inorganic matter one moves on to observe and contemplate on the world of men and animals and note the variety of species. In this manner is this universe ever so expansive. Therefore those people, after observations, thought and contemplation, procure and convey correct information about it. They are the ones who have the true and correct sense and feelings of the greatness, magnificence and grandeur of the laws of God, and fear and tremble in opposing it. Do consider, the word alema was used expressly and only on those who were engaged in the observation and contemplation of the various parts and portions of the universe. This is called science. Hence, in modern phraseology its translation would be a scientist, who after his observation and research uses the results for the prosperity of humanity in accordance with the revelation and laws of God. But when Dean relegated into religion the word alema was demoted to that of a mere librarian. You will be astonished with my usage of the word, librarian, for the religious alema. Do you know who is the greatest alam amongst you? He, who can show what Bukhari has said pertaining to a certain issue or problem. What has Futter al-Bari written in his exegesis? What has Alama al-Lusi ordained on this matter? What has Alama Shami copied from Sheikh Pound Nehemam? He who can give the greatest quotes and rearances is regarded to be the greatest mufti deen, the Muslim jurist and the expounder of the irrevocable code of Muslim law. If this is not the work of a librarian then what is? Since this religious world is divorced from wisdom the most correct answer would be the one that does not have even a shadow of reason. I hope one single instance will suffice to show you as to what extent they are occupied with the usage of thought and contemplation. This will also serve to impress on you as to what these treasures of storehouses of books contain. A friend was on his journey to Mecca and I asked him to find out by meeting as many alema and as varied as they were from the countries they came from. On my friend's return he told me that he met more or less all the alema from Mecca and Medina and those of various countries. The issue greatly talked about was whether in Arafat and Mazudilva the curtailment of the obligatory Salath is allowed or not whether or not prayers can be said in cemeteries. Then the most of all debated questions was about the usage of loudspeakers in prayers. Two Imams of Harm, Sheikh Abdul Zahir and Sheikh Abdul Mahiman Abu al-Samar, and Sheikh Abdul Razak, 
Head of Madrasa, School of Dal al Hadis Makkah and Sheikh Abdur Razak al Afifi al Zeri. Each and every one of the SC Great Ulema were discussing the same issues of importance aforesaid. There were also discussions on beards and whether to eat on tables. The reason being that when worldly affairs are handed over to the worldly ones, then what else is there for the religious faithful to discuss or talk about? Among these ulema there is a group which calls itself the non-conformists. This may create doubt in the minds of the unknowing that probably these people may believe in using wisdom and thought. But this misapprehension is due to not being fully acquainted. Conformist and non-conformist are but sectarian terminology. Both have nothing to do with wisdom or thought. Religions conformists are those who conform to the fiqh while the non-conformists conform to the narratives, the sayings or the ahadith, the traditions. Both groups in support of the conformity give the reason that they follow the disciples, the great companions of Nabi Muhammad. Peace be upon him all the religious leaders of the fiqh. When saying this they do not consider that neither the companions nor the leaders of the fakir were conforming to any one. They sought solutions to the issues of the day themselves, and the best way to follow them would be to seek solutions to issues of their own times themselves within the limits laid down by Allah. Just consider. A people who had discarded and not used their faculties of thought and reason for a hundred years, how could you expect that the potentialities of thought and understanding could have survived? As to how deeply but invisibly and imperceptibly the conduct of our forefathers have penetrated their subconscious, could be ascertained from different examples. A Muslim child would leap towards meat while a child of the Jain sect would feel nauseated at the sight of it. Its behavior is not the outcome of a well-thought-out plan but is merely a subconscious act. Then again consider a Muslim reaction. Of the things that Quran has forbidden, one is. 2. 173. Anything that which is attributed to another but Allah. Well, among us it is customary to make offering to saints and the spirituals. In so being imputed to other than Allah is the reason for its sanctity and its superiority is therefore proven obviously. And also in our homes because it is a common ritual it is therefore eaten by the young as well as the old. It, therefore, does not have any effect on our health and behavior. On the contrary. Since a rat has never been part of our diet, a mere sight of it or any reference to it while eating makes one sick, so much so, that one will not drink the alcohol in the glass wherein a rat may have fallen. To him, it becomes haram. All this happens subconsciously because in this context your mind refuses to consider that your reaction ought to have been rational. From these examples. Just consider that when a people blindly continue following the steps of its fathers, forefathers, elders and ancestors then, its reactions towards events and incidents would not be based on or resultant of their thought and consideration or wisdom. Rather their reactions would wholly be motivated by the subconscious. A total non-intellectualism and subconsciousness has taken over their faculties of senses and perceptions. Once they actually regard a thing subconsciously as commendable, and commendable it will remain in their eyes and vice versa. Nor do they have any sound argument for its commendability nor do they have any reason or argument to disprove it otherwise. It is because of the demands of these very polemics and debates that they are forced to look for the rationale behind the veracity of their ways. But these polemics are always a competition of personal abilities of the rival sects. Each group comes forward with the Iman that his way is the right one, and the other has gone astray and deviated from the right path. Having said this what follows is a personal confrontation and no more. The one with a glib tongue wins this verbal match. These days propaganda has taken the place of polemics. Whichever group has greater resources for propaganda, overcomes the other.
The Quranic truths, intellect and wisdom were not their concern then nor are they at present. This is the state and condition for a thousand years of the religious-minded Muslims, and it still continues to be so. In such state of mind can there be any hope of fresh new thought, on which is based the life of the people. Centuries of conformity and blind imitation have darkened the Muslim mind, likened to cell in a mosque and monastic caves. No ray of intellectual light can penetrate through it. When a people's mind is developed in such darkness, then there is no way as to how they could see the paths of soaring high and evolving. His state is 20. 40. As in the depths of the darkness of the ocean, waves upon waves of darkness come rising up. In the sky, dark clouds keep gathering and mounting up making it black and overcast. Darkness upon darkness keeps rising up and up. Such darkness that not even your hand is visible when stretched out. Let alone positioning others because you cannot reckon your very own. How could it be visible? It could have been visible but only with the light of Deen but if light is not taken from the Divine Deen then where else would it be available? Religion is darkness in itself, therefore only darkness will be available from darkness. How can light be availed of it? This is the state of Muslims today. His world is in the accursed grip of despotism. Monarchical governments, capitalism, feudalism and landlordism, in short, all the social and economic disharmonies, which Quran has termed as façade fil arth, are all but demonstrations of this great curse. Now think, after this how can a ray of light from anywhere enter his heart? and his future is hidden in the darkness of religious rituals and traditions, scholastic polemics, and the mystical spell. Entwined in the darkness of these will o' the wisps this poor Muslim looks up to the other nations with wistful eyes, wondering what is happening to him. According to Alamar Iqbal, there remained not that mirror of your conscience Oslain, unrequited love of royalty, priesthood and the mullahism. The basic reason for this decline. These then are the reasons for the decline of the Ummah. Reasons being merely by way of details, for in fact there is only one reason, that is, the Muslims' own man-made religion. The difference between religion and deen be once again brought forth so that you do not enter into the misunderstanding that I am. Allah forbid. An atheist teaching atheism. Deen is the name of that code of life which Allah gave us in its complete form and is now enclosed in the Quran, and which his last Nabi has shown us pragmatically in a practical form. Nor was there in it monarchy, nor priesthood, nor monasteries, nor sectarianism, nor any schism. The entire people and nation were one unity, the Ummah had one order, and this order had one central headquarter. The orders from this center were obeyed, by way of act and deed, by the followers. Whereas against this and in complete contrast, religion is the name of those collections of beliefs, of the theories, rites, and rituals all of which are man-made. Its aim is that every individual shall have his salvation, mukti, in Hindi, which will be attained only after death. It has no share in this world, as it is not relevant to it. In it, monarchy, capitalism, priesthood, monasticism, sectarianism, all this exists. Therefore in this book wherever the word religion occurs in contrast to deen, it should be understood accordingly so as to avoid any misunderstanding. All the Anbiya of Allah brought deen but their followers, after their passing away, turned this deen into religion. At Nabi Muhammad's manifestation there was no deen anywhere. Everywhere religion prevailed. Islam was a challenge to these religions. It came to wipe them out, so that the shackled humanity gained freedom. The freedom to lead a life in accordance with the laws of God. But after the departure of Nabi Muhammad, peace be upon him, whatever the previous people did with their respective deen were the very things we did with our deen. We too, changed it into religion.
Hence whatever happened to the people of yore happened to us, and is continuing to happen. To date, no religious-minded people have made any progress. Look far and wide and you will see it. The more religious a people, the more lowly and backward they are. The totally religiously immersed people of Tibet, the Lamas, and their followers are an example. Then again, among those people wherein one section is religious and the other worldly, the worldly one is far better off and successful than its religious counterpart who is but poor and indigent. In India, the Hindu Orthodox faith, the Sanatham sect, never ever progressed. In Europe itself, the Christian monastic groups always lag behind. The buffeting of the world's bellows gradually makes the religious-minded groups to be sheared and sliced off and melt into the worldly groups, which is gradually increasing in numbers, while the religious-minded are decreasing within the confines of the four walls of their places of worship. When the intensity of these buffeting bellows increases, as it is generally happening in Europe nowadays, then religion is waved a final goodbye and the people in their entirety become purely worldly, as has happened in Russia, China and other East European countries. While the majority of the Muslims are religious-minded therefore they are in the miserable, lowly and indigent state. All that has happened to the other religious-minded elsewhere, has happened to them and is still in vogue. Note with what clarity Quran states this great fact. It says Allah's message has always been one of guidance and mercy. 2. 26. From this very Quran many people will receive guidance, mercy and counsel and to many others will come the share of going astray. Destruction in accordance with the laws of the Quran. Consider this great and illustrious ayat stated above. Allah says that from this very Quran many people's share would be to go astray. That very water which is fundamental in saving life can also become the very cause of man's death. Who then are those in whose chair would come nothing but destruction? It states. 2. 26. Going astray would be the share of the Fasikin. But the question is who are the Fasikin? It says. 2. 27. Those people who had pledged to establish the code of life according to the laws of God but after that broke that pledge. A greater clarification is given in these words. 2. 27. Yes. They are those people who have cut into pieces those things that God ordered them to keep intact. God's law has shown life to be an indivisible unit, in length as well as in breadth. In length, this world, and the hereafter, in the present and the future there is no limit, separation, or division. It is a continuous and coherent flow from here to there. Therefore, the division of the world and the hereafter into two different entities is a fiscue and is also shirk in the same manner. Human unity is shattered by disharmony dividing of humankind into persons, races, tribes, and nations. This is fiscu. The practical result of this fiscu and shirk will be thus. 2. 27. In life disharmonies will be created and the fate of such people would be big failures and their objectives will remain unfulfilled. Have you noticed that in these brief ayat how Quran has hinted towards an immense basic human law? It states that the Code of Deen came to put into practice the unity of life. This was the Code whose result would have been reformation of the world. Harmony in the cultural life of man. And was the center and focus of the pleasant and wholesome and brilliance of the future. This was the correct way. Of guidance and counsel. After that the believers of the Quran themselves dismembered this unity and with it dismembered the Quran too. The result was destruction of the present and destruction of the future too. This is, in Quranic terms, degradation. But when people made this Quran serve their personal motives and use it accordingly then the Quran, instead of being a spring of advice and counsel, became a cause of their straying away.
and what else, it says, could be the consequence. Indeed it was a code of life but in the hands of religion it became the means of sending Savab to the dead. For a thousand years these people are moving around evidently with the Quran clasped to their chest but from this Quran they received nothing except humiliation and non-fulfillment of their ambitions. Because it is the law of the universe that every element must be in its original position, only then it would avail itself of its latent gains. If it is removed from its original position the same element becomes harmful. Place a craft on water and the water becomes its means to float. Bring the same water atop the craft and the water will become a flood to sink the craft. According to Quranic connotations, to remove an element from its correct position is called zulm. Which is why Quran has indicated that for the zalamin is failure, ruination and nothing else. 17. 82 and whatever we have sent down in the Qur'an for the believers is a mercy and a healing. But those who displace it from its correct position for them is harm and loss and nothing else. In the life of a Muslim the thing that is proving, to be a source of loss is the Qur'an which has been displaced from its correct position. When it was in its true and original position it was called deen and when removed from its position it became religion. In any case, Quran remains the same although its position is altered. Once again, it should be understood that the ayat, with which we began this discourse, does not mean that in the world people will get both guidance and deviation from the Quran. Quran is totally a source of eternal guidance and counsel. It is light. From it, guidance is attained in totality. Then one does not go astray. What it has said is that if the Quran is regarded as the code of life and life lived accordingly, then only guidance will be obtained. But when it is assumed merely as a religious book, with the aim of using it to send savab to the dead, thereby removing it from its correct position, and subordinating it to one's own ideas and beliefs then the share of people, who act in such a manner, can be nothing but humiliation and going astray. This is in fact what is happening to the Muslims today for their not using the Quran as it should be, and are therefore enduring the consequences. The Quranic reason for the decline has now come before us loud and clear. It is also clear as to what are the paths that could lead us from decline to our ascent. The matter is plain and transparent, although I doubt whether our people will comprehend this vision. It is possible to explain the subtle point of the unity of God but there already are idols in your mind which make it difficult. So far we have seen. 1. That in the ascending paths and the life of people the main stumbling block is religion. 2. No people can advance until it totally dissociates itself from religion. 3. Many peoples of the world took their step towards advancement only after deciding to drop their religions. Since they did not have before them the revelation of God, so some of them a. restricted their religions in the confinements of the four walls of the temples and the churches and for their worldly and day-to-day -day affairs, they decided by expediency. This is secularism. b. Some of them absolutely rejected religion. This is also secularism. 4. As for the Muslims, the deen of Allah in its pure and original state is with them in the Quran. Therefore, if they care to attain a scent or soar in life, then they will have to discard their present religion, and act and adopt the deen of Allah. But if the religious-minded section among us stubbornly sticks to its arrogance, and keeps telling the people that the deen is what is in practice presently amongst them. This will result in either one or the other. a. These people will be destroyed totally or b. They too will confine themselves within four walls of the mosque and go secular. In both cases deen will not remain with them. Through secularism, they too will gain immediate profits, but like the Westerners, they will also live in international hell.